So welcome everybody to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh uh, for a Zoom and YouTube uh, presentation. Uh, it's nice to see everybody out there. And uh, without further ado, I shall move on. So we've got a couple of new members. I don't know if any of them are online. If they are, maybe they could wave or something. We've got Francis Podmore. And... Hello. Oh. Hi, Francis. Martin Ratho. And uh, Xiong Lam. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, but uh, that's my attempt. So welcome. Can we just welcome in the usual way? Thank you very much for joining the society. Thank you very much. Keeping in touch with us is uh, a relatively easy manner. We have our website and a lot of videos on YouTube that uh, of past talks are from the uh, sort of uh, interesting to the very demanding. Uh, so there's a good selection. So that's a quick picture of our website. These, this is a list of some of the uh, the YouTube, YouTube videos that are on there, which is, as I say, covers many, many subjects. Uh, this is a selection of the photographs that are on, or, or astral photographs that are on uh, our Flickr group, all done by our own merry, merry men and ladies. Uh, and uh, there's a good selection there now, some of them extremely high quality. Coming up in the next couple of months, uh, just a few things for us to, to look at. The life of a planetary system, that sounds really interesting, as long as it doesn't say that ours is about to disappear somewhere. Uh, the Imaging and Observing Group, which is uh, for members only. We're having a talk about comets from Nick James of the BAA. Then the Chernikov Telescope Array, which I didn't know much about. So I'm going, looking forward to, to that one, Dr. Roberta Zanin. And on the 7th of April, we're having a members only night uh, where ASE members, and I presume uh, there'll be a few of them up there, give short presentations on things they're interested in or things they've been doing. I've no doubt Hugh will be there to the fore. Will you hear? I'll, I'll be in Canada. Oh, dear. I'm not sure whether I'll be able to join you, but we'll give it a try. On the 12th of March, we have another imaging observing group. Then on the 21st of April, the High Seas Project, which looks really intriguing, Dr. Michaela Muzilova. Then on the 5th of May, I think this may be the first formal one we've had about the JWST, apart from the, all the ones we had before it ever took off. So looking forward to that. And that will be on uh, Zoom and YouTube. Again, the members on the Imaging and Observing Group, and then Indigenous Australian Astronomy by Dr. Pete Kazuma. And that will be, again, Zoom and on YouTube, and sounds intriguing. So. That's what's coming up in the near future. So uh, keep everybody interested and busy. And guess what? It's not going to move forward anyway. Well, I'm going to stop sharing if I can and hand over, I think Sarah was going to introduce Evelyn. Yep. I, um, need to, I need to stop the share first. Okay. And I'm having trouble finding my mouse. There we go. Okay, so um, we're really happy to have uh, Professor Levesque uh, presenting tonight. Um, Emily Levesque is an astronomy professor at the University of Washington. Her work explores how the most massive stars in the universe evolve and die. She's observed um, up to 
up to 50 nights on many of the planet's largest telescopes and has flown over the Antarctic stratosphere in an experimental aircraft for her research. It sounds very exciting. Um, she's currently a 2022 to 2023 Fulbright US scholar and, um, and also Guggenheim Fellow. And her book, uh, which is The Last Stargazers, which I'm sure um, some of you will be aware of, uh, was shortlisted for the 2021 Royal Society Science Book Prize. Um, so welcome, Emily, um, and we'll let you uh, take over from there. All right, thank you so much for the introduction and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak remotely today. It's great to get the chance to share some of these stories, even at very large distances with astronomy clubs and anybody who's really enthusiastic about astronomy. So it looks like you can now see my screen. Does that look good to everyone? If yes, you see a few see it. Okay. nods. Excellent. So I'll be talking tonight about my book, The Last Stargazers, which is my very first popular science book. And it was an adventure to write, um, an adventure to learn about in research. And hopefully some of that will come across tonight. Writing the book was an interesting experience because I wrote it just before the pandemic. And the early days of the pandemic corresponded with when we started, you know, starting to promote and advertise and sell the book. So much of that was also done online. But I did get the chance to go to one or two book conferences and, and events where I could talk with other authors. I went to a wonderful library conference in Nashville, Tennessee, shortly before the pandemic began, where I got to meet other authors. We sat on this big panel and people got to tell everybody about their books. One interesting point that came up during that panel was the opening lines of our books. And this topic was raised with the memory of, you know, infamous, beautiful first lines of books. Things like, you know, Call Me Ishmael from Moby Dick, or It Was a Dark and Stormy Night, which is how um, A Wrinkle in Time, my favorite book, begins. And there was a point made that, you know, opening lines set the tone of a book. They welcome you into whatever world your reader is going to be spending time in. They really are meant to set the pace and introduce people to the book wonderfully right off the bat. And it got me thinking, well, okay, what's the first line of my book? And I realized the first line of The Last Stargazers is, have you tried, oh, my slides aren't advancing, I'm very sorry. Um, my screen seems to have frozen. Let me try that one more time. There we go. This is the first line of my book. Have you tried turning it off and on again? It doesn't sound like the start of a great adventure. It sounds like every frustrating phone call you've ever had with your internet service provider. But this is actually one of the most petrifying questions I've ever been asked in astronomy because I was asked this question while sitting here. I was observing at the Subaru telescope atop Mauna Kea um, in Hawaii. I was a graduate student at the University of Hawaii. I was in the middle of taking observations for my PhD thesis research, and I was using Subaru, one of the largest telescopes in the world. This telescope has a mirror that's eight meters in diameter, uh, just for scale. This is me standing beneath another telescope with about the same size mirror. So you can see the scale of scientific instrument I was working with. And in the midst of using a telescope of this size on a night that had otherwise been going wonderfully, we suddenly sitting in the control room heard one of the computers make this terrible sort of blink sound. And I remember looking over at the computer and then looking at the only other person on the mountain with me, who was the telescope operator. She very calmly looked at that computer and then looked at me and said, I don't think that's a problem. I think the mirror is still on the telescope. And this was not the reassuring comment that I think she meant for it to be, because I didn't realize that mirrors like this could come off telescopes. I asked her what it meant and what could be wrong. And she explained that the alarm was telling us that the telescope's secondary mirror was actually at risk of becoming unsupported. So just as a reminder on a telescope of this scale, uh, this is a photograph of the interior of another telescope at Palomar Observatory in California. In these, in a telescope set up like this, the big primary mirror is actually near the bottom of the screen. The secondary mirror you can see is the big cylinder at the top of the screen. It's suspended in the case of Subaru about 70 feet in the air and carefully supported by a mechanical structure that allows it to tip back and forth and point while staying perfectly still. 
The alarm had told us that the mechanized supports holding up that secondary had failed. So if we moved the telescope the wrong way, the secondary was at risk of slipping off the telescope and plummeting about 70 feet and then hitting the concrete floor of the telescope. And this is if we were lucky. If we were unlucky, it would hit this primary mirror on the way down. So with this in mind, we made a phone call to the engineers that run the telescope and asked them what to do. And their response was, oh, that alarm probably isn't an issue. It's probably a false alert. You can probably fix this problem. They said probably over and over. You could probably fix this just by turning the telescope off and back on again. And it seemed kind of impolite to say, that's how I fix my modem at home. That's not how I feel like fixing a telescope the size of a building. And as the graduate student in charge of the observing run, it was left to me to decide what we should do. In a conservative scenario, we would just stop observing, leave the telescope, wait to make sure that this was a false alarm and go down the mountain for the night. But if I did that, I would lose all the data that I was working on getting for my thesis. But if we kept observing, we were at risk of breaking the largest piece of glass in the world. And I sat there mulling over this problem and just kept thinking of stories I'd been told about telescopes that had failed spectacularly. The one that kept coming to mind was this radio telescope in West Virginia. This is one of the, or was, one of the biggest and most powerful radio telescopes in the world. There was an infamous story in the field of how this telescope had worked fine for decades, getting beautiful observations, until one night in the 70s when the telescope went from this to this. It had suffered a catastrophic collapse. I couldn't remember sitting at Subaru what had caused this problem, but I was convinced in my mind that someone had tried turning it off and on again. So I was now faced with the decision of what to do. I didn't want to be the graduate student that killed Subaru, but I also didn't want to leave what might have just been a false alarm and lose precious telescope time for my thesis that I might not be able to get back for a year or even more. So this is the story that I actually used to start The Last Stargazers, because it gives people this behind the scenes look at how astronomy is actually done. It's really not hard to interest people in space. Everybody's captivated by the beautiful pictures of the night sky that we get from Hubble or James Webb. Everybody loves the romance of imagining what's out there in the universe and admiring these exquisite pictures we're able to take of it. But what fewer people know are the behind the scenes stories of where these pictures come from and who's taking them and how they actually happen. I think if you asked a lot of people to imagine a professional astronomer, the picture that came to their mind would be something like this. They would most likely picture a man wearing a lab coat for some reason and apparently sporting a beard standing next to a small backyard telescope on a little tripod that he looks through with his eye. And it's a very fair picture for people to have because it's how most of us interact with astronomy as children and then growing up and studying astronomy as adults. Any astronomy club that has an open house night, anybody who does amateur observations in their backyard, anybody who even remembers using a telescope at school or at university as part of a science event did something like this. They got to look through a telescope and enjoy the moon or Saturn and just admire the beauty of the sky. So they imagine professional astronomy as this just done on a grand scale. This was definitely the picture that I had of astronomy when I was little. So this is me at age six, and I'm very proudly sporting my Hubble Space Telescope t-shirt because Hubble had launched that same year. I knew even at that age that I loved astronomy, that I wanted to do science, but I really didn't have much of a sense of what science was. My best glimpse of this was from my own amateur astronomy experiences in the backyard with my dad. So this is us using our eight inch Celestron telescope. I remember getting beautiful views of the night sky, but not quite being sure how this would turn into a full-time job as a scientist. Based on the movies that I watched growing up, I had some sense of what scientists did, but that sense got a little skewed. I think from watching Jurassic Park and Twister, I was convinced that scientists spend a lot of time being chased by whatever they're studying, whether it's dinosaurs or tornadoes. And Contact, while it's a wonderful book and an amazing movie, even with that movie, I was pretty sure that astronomers didn't discover aliens every single day. So I didn't get a really good idea of what being an astronomer would be like until I was in college. 
the summer after my second year at MIT, I flew to Arizona for a summer research project and I drove with my research advisor to Kitt Peak National Observatory. This was my very first visit to a professional observatory. And that very first night we sat down at dinner and met all of the other astronomers on the mountain who were using the many different telescopes on the summit. And Phil introduced me to everyone. He looked around and said, this is Emily. She's my summer student. And this is her first night observing at a professional telescope. And the whole table went, oh, this, that's great. Welcome. This is going to be so much fun. You're going to love it. Remember to drink some coffee now so that you can stay awake all night, but stop drinking coffee at about 2 a.m. Otherwise, you'll be way too keyed up and excited to sleep when you finish observing. Someone else then said, oh, this is great. Have fun. But, you know, keep an eye on the floor. We have some little scorpions that like to run around the mountain. They're the same color as the carpet and they can cause problems. A woman once had one climb up the inside of her pant leg and sting her while she was observing. I now work with this woman at the University of Washington. Other people said, oh, well, the scorpions are nothing. I know a guy who was observing once when he had a raccoon get into the dome of the telescope. And then someone else said, well, I know someone who's observing when a telescope got struck by lightning. And they all just started passing these stories around of crazy adventures and misadventures that had happened to astronomers while they were observing. And I remember sitting at dinner with my fork almost stuck halfway to my mouth. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to stay there all night and just listen to these stories or whether I wanted to run off to the telescope and start making some stories of my own. I realized years later, remembering that very first dinner, that this sort of storytelling and sharing the kind of wacky adventures of astronomy were how the other astronomers had invited me into the field and given me a sort of glimpse of what was in store for me and what I was getting myself into working as a professional observational astronomer. So years later, that storytelling is what formed the basis of The Last Stargazers. I wanted to use this book to gather the stories from my colleagues and I and give readers this behind the scenes tour through professional astronomy, how we do our work, how that work has evolved and what it's like to actually be a person working in this field. The Last Stargazers was an Amazon best book of 2020. It was, as mentioned, a finalist for the Royal Society Science Book Prize, along with several science writing prizes here in the US. Um, it's It was an incredible adventure to write, and writing it actually gave me the opportunity to do several pretty interesting things. I really visited some observatories that I either had not been, that I hadn't been to in years. I visited others for the first time. Uh, that picture on the upper left is me at a gravitational wave observatory here in my home state of Washington. I got the chance to visit historical observatories like Palomar in California. I got to fly on a telescope, which I'll get back to in a moment. I think though the biggest adventure of writing this book is the picture that you see on the lower right though. And this is me holding my trusty voice recorder. I used this to record interviews with more than 100 of my colleagues. And I sat down with all of them, asking them to tell me their stories of astronomy, their adventures at telescopes and their most vivid memories of working as astronomers. For the most part, I just let everyone talk, but there were a few questions that I wanted to ask everyone. I wanted The Last Stargazers to have a cohesive theme rather than just be a collection of wacky anecdotes and tales. So I asked everybody these three questions and I'm going to use these to outline the rest of this talk. The first thing I liked asking was, what's your most memorable second or third or 10th hand observing story? People told me about their own adventures, but I was really interested in hearing these stories that somebody half remembered overhearing at a conference, tales told by the friend of a friend of a researcher who had once heard stories that had certainly turned into half true tales, but that had really entered the memory of the field. There was a particular type of story that people loved telling me. And I think the most common answer to this referred to one story in particular. It was, you know, where there were these weird bursts of radio light that happened at a telescope in, I think, New Zealand or somewhere, and they turned out to be something weird. People would sort of remember the story, but knew enough to point me in the right direction. I wound up tracking down this original tale, studying weird radio bursts at Parks Observatory in Australia. So back in 2007, this radio telescope detected this brief blast of radio emission. 
complete, and it took observers completely by surprise. This wasn't anything that had been previously predicted. It was not an observation that they had previously noticed at the telescope. It was earmarked as an odd, unusual event with no clear explanation, and people moved on. Years later, an astronomer named Emily Petroff showed up in Australia to do her PhD thesis, and she was interested in getting to the bottom of this event and others like it. She thought there might be some really exciting scientific explanation for what could possibly produce a brief blast of radio light. When she told the observatory staff this, though, they said, oh, no, don't bother. We actually turned out to have been detecting these all the time. We can't imagine there's anything scientifically interesting in this. We must just be accidentally detecting radio light from some interference source here on the ground. The observatory had actually come to nickname these events peritons, which is a mythical creature that looks like one thing but casts the shadow of something else. These looked like scientifically interesting objects, but were probably just the remnant of something emitting radio light here on the ground. Emily wasn't convinced, so she decided to get to the bottom of explaining what these peritons actually were to see if there could be any interesting science to be had. She thought some of these bursts might be real, but that meant explaining the others away and figuring out where exactly they were coming from. So the first clue as she and the observatory staff started working on this came when they looked at when the peritons were detected and they realized that they tended to cluster around the lunchtime hour. So space is a pretty weird place, but space does not care what time lunchtime is in Australia. And this gave them their first hint. If you look at this aerial view of Parks Observatory, you can see three different outbuildings marked with arrows. These are administrative buildings on site that have offices and workspaces and break rooms where people can go in to make some tea or maybe heat up some lunch in one of the three microwaves on site. So they looked at these microwaves as potential culprits because they knew that these could produce radio interference. The researchers were so wonderfully careful about how they tested this idea. They ran the microwaves on high and low power. They tried different durations. They were always careful to microwave the exact same thing. They would run the microwaves and then check the telescope, but they weren't picking up peritons. For a while, they were really puzzled as to what this could be, and they thought that the microwave idea must be wrong. And then someone pointed out that they were behaving like very careful scientists. They were obediently putting the mug in the microwave, waiting 10 seconds while it ran, and then removing it and checking the telescope data. They should have been acting like hungry people waiting to heat up some leftovers. Because when you heat something up in a microwave and you're a little bit impatient, you watch the microwave count down and you see the clock going four, three, to, close enough. And you open the door of the microwave, we've all done it, to stop it running just a little bit early and take your food out. When they tried this, when they opened the microwaves while they were still running, they were able to produce a periton. The telescope picked this up as a brief burst of radio light, and they had seemingly explained all these weird radio bursts that Parks had been detecting for years. And when they went back through the data, this did in fact explain everything they detected, except that original first burst that they detected in 2007. That one and many others like it that have been detected since then are true and interesting astrophysical phenomena known as fast radio bursts. We're still figuring out where they come from. We think they're coming from dying stars and other galaxies. We're still sussing out the physics of how these work, but this entire field of science never could have happened if we hadn't first rediscovered microwaves and learned to separate impatient lunch havers from actual dying stars somewhere else in the universe that we want to study in more detail. People loved telling me stories like this where telescopes accidentally detected something that we might have thought would be something really interesting and turned out to be a bit closer to home. My favorite story that I actually got after writing the book, so I wasn't able to include it, also happened at Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. I showed this observatory earlier where you saw the collapse of a large radio telescope. The telescope was fortunately rebuilt. So this is the beautiful big new replacement. And it was rebuilt because the part of West Virginia that this observatory is in is one of the best sites for radio astronomy on the planet. It's in what we call the radio National Radio Quiet Zone. In the area directly around the telescope, people are not allowed to use microwaves. They don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have cell phones. At the site, all of the vehicles are even run on diesel rather than 
with traditional internal combustion engines because even those engines produce little bursts of radio light. They take great pains to make sure there's nothing that could accidentally emit radio and trick observers. This area is also in a really beautiful state park with an abundance of natural life. And there were some researchers that not too long ago decided they wanted to study a small population of flying squirrels in the area. They wanted to study these squirrels' movements and keep track of how they worked as a population. And they did this by fitting the squirrels with radio collars which meant they then unleashed a swarm of little, very cute sources of radio noise that essentially rendered the telescope unusable. Apparently they had to shut down and just do engineering work on the telescope for quite a while because anytime they tried to turn it on and observe, they would just pick up squirrels instead of whatever an observer was trying to study. You see this happen at radio telescopes a lot. You see this happen at optical telescopes. Even gravitational wave observatories aren't immune from this sort of interference. So this is an aerial view of the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, right here in my home state of Washington. And the design of these detectors and how they detect gravitational waves is just exquisite because the detector consists of two perfectly straight arms that are four kilometers long, and they connect at a central building with a laser that can actually shine down to the ends of the arms and back and very specifically measure the arms lengths. They've been built to be perfectly exactly the same length. So when a laser is fired down to the end of the arms and back, the laser arrives back at the central building at the same time from each arm. And we know that everything is working as it should. The two arms are the same length. Nothing unusual is happening. When a gravitational wave passes through Earth and the space time that it's in, though, it slightly squeezes and stretches the Earth. So one of those arms will get stretched very slightly, the other will be squeezed very slightly, and there is a minute difference in their lengths. So when the laser is fired, it bounces down and back on the arms and arrives back at that central building at a very slightly different time. This gives us a signal that we now know can be caused by a gravitational wave. The difficulty is that these detector detectors are unbelievably sensitive. Those little squeezes and stretches of gravitational waves passing through the earth are thousands of times smaller than the size of a proton. So if this detector can pick up something that small, it can also pick up things like earthquakes or footsteps or raindrops hitting the ground. It's sensitive to absolutely anything that can shake the detector. As a result, the engineering work on these observatories has been dedicated to keeping them as protected from any little perturbations as possible. But even that work couldn't be perfect. There was a incident at this observatory years ago where observers were starting to pick up a strange signal. The lasers were arriving back at slightly different times. Something was being slightly perturbed or shaken at the observatory. It looked like maybe they could be detecting something interesting, but they were fairly sure it was just an interference source on the ground. They later traced the problem back to these strange marks on one of the exterior pipes of the observatory. The observatory is cooled using liquid nitrogen, which means that in a hot summer in the middle of the desert in Eastern Washington, ice would start to form on the pipes on the exterior and that ice would actually form a convenient drink for something like a thirsty raven flying around the site and looking for a chance to get a little bit of water. These ravens were landing on the observatory, pecking on it, and actually shaking it enough to create a perturbation and a signal that the observers had to sort through and explain before they could go back to looking for gravitational waves. They actually tested this by having a graduate student go out and tap on the uh, pipe with a hammer to mimic a raven and make sure that this worked. But even they were able to be fooled by some ground-based source tricking them into what might be an interesting detection from deep space. So people loved telling me those accidental detection stories. Another question that I asked everyone was what they thought would surprise readers of my book the most about the job of an astronomer. What would be the biggest di disconnect between what people think we do and what we actually do? And a lot of answers came back saying, you know, this picture that people have of astronomers standing in lab coats and waiting next to little telescopes really isn't accurate. We wind up having some really incredible adventures in our work. I got the chance to hear about some amazing adventures over the course of writing the book, and I got to have a couple of my own. 
one of my favorite things that I did in the course of this research was fly on board this airplane. This is NASA's Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA. It's a specially modified Boeing 747 that's designed to fly up into the stratosphere at about 45,000 feet, so higher than commercial airplanes fly. Once it's up there, it opens that rear door that you can see in the back of the plane and exposes a telescope custom built to detect infrared light. By flying up into the stratosphere, this plane gets above 99% of the planet's water vapor and is able to detect light that would normally bounce off that water vapor before ever making it to the ground. I got to fly on Sophia as part of my research for this book and as part of my own research studying very cold, massive stars and how they work. I got to fly down to Christchurch, New Zealand. We flew out of the southern tip of New Zealand and actually got almost down to the Antarctic Circle. We flew so far south that we actually saw the southern lights out the doors of the plane, out the windows of the plane as we flew. It is definitely one of the coolest things that I've ever gotten to do for my research or in astronomy, period. And I wound up writing an entire chapter in the book about Sophia and its predecessors. The field of airborne astronomy has become a really fast fascinating subfield in astronomy. Other people will actually do similar airborne work by launching telescopes on board gigantic weather balloons or even on suborbital rockets to try and get above as much of our atmosphere as possible. I also talk to people who chase solar eclipses, who travel all over the planet, carrying their research equipment with them to capture that moment of totality because it's one of the best chances that we have to study the outer layers of the sun. I talked to astronomers who worked at telescopes in the South Pole and who had actually wintered over at the South Pole to use to take advantage of some of the best observing conditions on the planet. I also got to learn about this man on the lower right. So I just got through saying that professional astronomers don't tend to wear lab coats and stand next to little telescopes. He is the exception, but he has an excellent excuse. So this is George Carruthers. He is the patent holder of the ultraviolet detectors that we now use in telescopes like Hubble that allow telescopes to observe ultraviolet light. He is standing next to the telescope that he designed and built to specifically detect in, um, ultraviolet light that was taken to the surface of the moon. This is the only telescope we've ever brought to the moon. It traveled there on board Apollo 16, and the astronauts used it for several days to take our very first ultraviolet images of our own planet, of young stars in our galaxy. It was our first ultraviolet glimpse of the entire universe. So we've gone to the Antarctic Circle and the stratosphere. We've sent balloons high into the Earth's atmosphere. We've traveled to the moon. The adventures that people have as they sort of traverse the planet to do astronomy were a wonderful aspect of writing this book, getting to hear all of these stories. I think my favorite story about a strange adventure that happened at a telescope actually happened right here in Washington at Manastash Ridge Observatory. So this is a pretty small telescope in central Washington state. It is a telescope used by the University of Washington where I currently work. And for a long time, it's been a training telescope for our undergraduates and PhD students. One of our PhD students back in 1980 was using this telescope for the first night of thesis observations. Thinking back to my experience at Subaru, it makes me think that thesis observations at telescopes might be a little bit cursed because he had one of the wildest experiences I'd ever heard anyone share at a telescope. He, in 1980, was taking careful notes on his observations in the telescope's observing log. So a notebook where he carefully kept track of every detail of how his observing run had gone. He was taking notes saying, I observed for 10 hours, I lost, you can see in the notes, zero hours due to weather or mechanical problems or anything like that. The sky condition was excellent. He describes clouds clearing off early, getting beautiful observations, excellent data. He had a great night of observing. He then closed the log and went to bed at about 5 a.m. And if you notice, the date on the log is May 18th, 1980. This date doesn't stick very much in most people's minds, but if I ever tell the story in Washington or in the northwest corner of the United States, people immediately go, oh, oh no, because they know what's coming. Doug went to bed that night and woke up at about 10 a.m. because he heard this sort of strange distant rumble sound. It barely caught his attention and he went back to sleep. He then woke up for good around noon 
and opened the door of his dormitory, ready to sort of get blinded by the midday sun and go check on the telescope and start his astronomer day. Instead, when he opened the door, he was greeted with complete blackness at noon. He grabbed a flashlight and tried to point it out the door, and the flashlight beam just got swallowed after about five feet. There was this awful sort of sour brimstone smell in the air. He thought he was living through the end of the world. He ran back indoors, grabbed a radio, and frantically tried to pick up a newscast to figure out what in the world was happening. And that was when he learned that earlier that morning, Mount St. Helens had erupted. This was a massive volcanic eruption in southwestern Washington, and it wound up proving to be a pretty interesting day for Doug because the volcanic plume of that eruption blew directly toward Manastash Ridge Observatory. You, actually, you can actually see what happened in satellite footage of the eruption. The volcano plume was blown to the northeast, right over Manastash Ridge and right over Doug. Being a good scientist, Doug's immediate response was to write about this in the night log after first taking care of the telescope. He ran out and covered the telescope's mirror to make sure that that corrosive volcanic ash wouldn't damage the mirror covering, and then carefully noted that he had lost six hours of observing. The reason was a volcano, the sky condition was black and smelly, and detailing what had happened. This page is still in the night log that sits up in, at Manastash Ridge Observatory, and we are pretty sure that Doug has the most dramatic incidents, though not the only instance, of losing observing time due to an erupting volcano. The last question that I asked people as I interviewed them was how astronomy had changed since they began observing. I talked to colleagues who had been observing at telescopes for 50 or 60 years. They had observed an amazing evolution of the field, and I wanted to hear them talk about what they had seen shift in astronomy over the course of their careers. Almost everyone pointed to how dramatically the technology of astronomy had changed. Back in really as late as the 1980s, astronomers taking photographs at observatories used technology like this. This is a picture of a glass photographic plate. You can see a beautiful image of one of my favorite star forming galaxies, one of my favorite spiral galaxies, NGC 6946. This is a galaxy that has hosted 11 supernovae in the past 100 years, which makes it very unusual. This image was taken by taking a delicate thin piece of glass that was specially treated on one side to darken when exposed to light. That sheet of glass was carefully sliced down so that it could fit into the camera at the telescope where the person was observing. The, the glass was specially treated with whatever trick the astronomer had on hand to make it as sensitive to light as possible. Astronomers would bake the plates or freeze them. They would rub them in lemon juice. They would bathe them in ammonia, anything to try and make them as light sensitive as possible. Astronomers would then sit next to these plates and shiver next to them for hours at telescopes, carefully exposing and tracking on a galaxy like this until the plate had darkened. And then they would head into a dark room at the end of the night and develop the plate in order to capture an image like this. It sounds to those of us used to the ease of a digital camera or the cameras we even have on our phones, like a really primitive way of taking pictures, but you can see the beautiful image that we're able to get of this spiral galaxy on the plate. We've made some of the biggest astronomy discoveries of the past century using glass photographic plates. I talked to lots of observers who describe years of working with plates. None of them missed the hassle of it all, although everyone had wonderful memories of working with plates, but they all pointed to the excitement that came in when we went to digital observing. You can compare this picture of the spiral galaxy taken with a photographic plate to the kind of image we can get today using the Subaru telescope that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. This is what that same galaxy looks like with the capabilities of the digital detectors on board Subaru. You can see now the beautiful detail of the spiral arms. You can see knots of newly forming stars and patches of dust. You can see the brilliant nucleus of the galaxy. Taken together, it's a huge improvement over what we were able to technologically do before. So people were very excited about these technological changes. However, they were also pointing out how much this has changed the way we do our jobs. This is another picture of me doing research for the book, and I'm actually standing in front of the Vera Rubin Observatory that's almost done being constructed in Chile. 
This observatory is taking full advantage of our new digital capabilities and our new automation capabilities to perform some really spectacular observations over the coming decade. Ruben is going to survey and photograph the entire southern sky once every few nights for 10 years. It's pretty much going to give us a decade-long movie of the night sky and capture every tiny thing that changes, every variable star that gets brighter and dimmer, every supernova that appears and starts to disappear, every little asteroid scooting through the sky that we might want to keep track of. The scientific capabilities of Rubin are going to be astonishing, but the quirk of this is that it's going to be doing most of these observations automatically. An astronomer won't have to go to this telescope and sit there and shiver in the dome all night or carefully keep track of the observations by hand. We are going to basically get these observations uploaded to a server where we can then download the data we need and conduct the research that we want to on data that was taken automatically. Combining this with the increased amount of automation that we moved to during the pandemic, it's really meant a shift in how astronomers do our jobs. And it's been an interesting thing to watch having written the book and then started to share stories of the book with people because it's really highlighted how many different tools we need in order to properly do our research. We need this sort of exciting cutting edge automation of something like the Rubin Observatory. We also need the capability to observe at different wavelengths like the radio telescopes that I talked about in Virginia or the infrared telescope on board SOFIA. We've been hearing a lot about the new advances of things like the James Webb Space Telescope newly launched. We really need this full suite of tools available to us in order to keep doing our research. The adventures that we have in astronomy are probably going to change as we start using different sorts of technology, but hopefully the core excitement and the core curiosity that people are bringing to the field will remain the same. So on that note, I wanted to put up my book's details one more time. Thank you again so much for joining me and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Emily, that's uh, excellent. Uh, lots of interesting things happen. Lots of electrical interference stories in my history, I have to say. But yes. uh, <laughs> shall we open up the questions? Can I start with a tremendous tribute to Emily and thank you so much for being with us this evening. I have your book. Oh, excellent. <laughs> it exists in the Edinburgh library system and I borrowed it as soon as I knew you were coming. And it's been a totally fascinating read. So as soon as I'm oh, finished, thank you. any of the rest of you watching can borrow it as well. Oh, There's a lot more in here than you were able to pack in, even you were talking about <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else is holding up their copy, too. I love it. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have uh, any any questions? I, was, I, I have a question. I was really... I, I see it. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, Emily? It looks saying? like someone's raised their hand. Yeah. Right. I don't spot it at the moment. Whoever it is... Fire away. Somebody, this big man, don't know who big man is. That will be myself. I was just going to say that I found that the presentation was very well done and incredibly interesting, particularly some of the historical aspects of it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask about the telescope that Apollo 16 left in the moon. I didn't actually know there had been a telescope taken to the to the moon and whether mm -hmm. it uh, produced any good results. It did. Um, so first of all, I didn't know about it either until I was researching the book. I think this is a disappointingly well-kept secret that we have brought a telescope to the moon. Um, it had a four inch aperture, it was tiny. Um, and it was actually really interesting to read reports after the fact of how difficult the telescope was for the astronauts to use because they've got these big bulky spacesuits and big clunky gloves. Um, the oil that I think was used to help the telescope turn wound up um, freezing if they put it in the shadow of the lunar lander. But then if they put the telescope in sunlight, obviously it wouldn't work for other reasons. It did get beautiful pictures of some 
of the, I, I believe it's, you know, some of the nearby O stars in the Milky Way. So a good chance to see UV emission from very young, very hot stars. The picture that I most remember seeing from it is actually of our own Earth, though. They pointed it back at the planet and you could see rings of the aurora in the northern and southern poles that wouldn't normally be observable in the optical, but they were able to catch sort of some of the UV emission from it. So as an early sort of prototype of an ultraviolet telescope, it was spectacular. Excellent. Do we have any more observations or questions? I've got a quick uh, comment, uh, Peter. Um, that was a lovely presentation and a very nice intro by Sarah as well. Um, Sophia or Sophia has now been retired about six months. I don't know if we were aware. It has. Yeah. I am. I was actually, I'm actually on the Sophia users or was on the Sophia users committee. So we were very heavily involved with that whole shutdown process from the scientific side. And I am holding up hope. I, I am waiting to find out what will become of Sophia, whether we will ever, whether it will ever fly again, whether it will go to something like a good aerospace museum, because it was an astonishing piece of technology. And it was yeah. really, really fun to fly on that. That was absolutely my favorite story in the whole book. Yeah, great. May I follow that up, uh, please, Emily, and say, I read about Sophia, and you said you had to fly at night, but why mm -hmm. if you're observing in the infrared? It's a good question. Um, so part of that is even as high as we were, um, you get a better image quality at night. Um, when the air is colder, you simply get less atmospheric turbulence. So the image quality will be crisper. Um, I, think so, I think I remember somebody explaining that even keeping the telescope cool is easier if you're doing this at night. Um, and depending on which wavelength it observes in, so it can observe at fairly short infrared wavelengths. Um, my observations were about as close to visible light as Sophia can manage. At those wavelengths, it really does help to be observing at night because the sun emits so much infrared that it would still wind up being a source of interference. In other cases, I believe it can fly during the day, but it's easiest to fly it at night. Um, a nice perk of that though is because the telescope can move it can sort of chase the night so a night on Sophia can be 14 hours long if it flies with the you know sunset and stays in um stays in darkness the whole time very good I was just going to make a comment actually Peter as well um Emily I was just thinking about um you know like the personality of and characteristics of being an astronomer and obviously you have to be very patient because anything could go wrong just in terms of the challenges of doing the job but also I was just thinking about the um the example you gave with the volcanic eruption and how the guy was just you know he's just filling in the log and then he filled in the log the next day and you know he didn't really appear to be having any kind of meltdown whatsoever. It was just, <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty incredible. So I, that was just my kind of thoughts on, on that as well. <laughs> this was an aspect of astronomy that I never would have predicted as a kid getting into astronomy, but I was surprised at how adventurous the field could be. And it is a funny combination of patience and then occasional panic. One of one of the people I interviewed for the book described astronomy when it's going well as the most exciting, boring job in the world. Because you show up at a telescope, you've asked for the time months in advance, you have a whole careful plan of what you want to observe and how and when. And if everything goes according to plan, it's very peaceful. Um, some of my observations have been on targets that I that I'll take an exposure that, you know, lasts an hour. So you point the telescope, you click expose, and then you kind of go, okay. <laughs> and like you, if, if you mean well, you try to do your research and usually you sort of devolve to surfing the internet. But then if something goes wrong, it's an immediate shift to panic because you don't want to waste so much as a moment on one of these telescopes. So if you think you're pointed at the wrong thing or there's an earthquake at the telescope or a fire or tarantulas in the dome, like I've heard all the different, ridiculous things that can go wrong at telescopes, you suddenly jump into a moment of panic. So it's a interesting combination of being patient, but also very even keeled when something does go amiss. <laughs> yeah. Can I move to Will now and ask if there's any questions from YouTube? 
Um, there's no no questions from YouTube, but lots of comments praising your talk. Um, that great talk, Emily. And a number of people, of course, saying they're going to be rushing out to get your book after hearing <laughs> your talks. And, so that's, that's oh, excellent. Good. I, I, I just <laughs> wondered, you. just 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 with the the moon thing, I presume that the telescope, everything that was sort of taken to the moon like that, was just simply left there. Is is that correct? Or so it's. Yep. It's quite an archive for people to find when when eventually we return in the future. Yeah, no, that, that telescope is still there. Uh, the only thing that they brought back, it's it's one of the only instances I found as I was researching the previous technologies that we used in astronomy. It's one of the only cases of using film to capture pictures. So they flew back with the film canister, um, made as light as it could possibly be. Yeah. But that's it. The rest of the telescope's still there. That's, uh, no, that is, that's fantastic. And um, no, it's an excellent talk. Thank you. Okay, Thank I think you. Big Man has his hand up. I was just wondering whether the camera, the UV camera that was left on the moon, whether it was just a one-off or whether others have been used elsewhere at any time? I know that a different, I mean, we now have UV detectors and cameras in a wide variety of instruments. Um, Hubble uses ultraviolet, uh, takes ultraviolet observations. Um, there's a lot of people working on sort of the next generation of UV observations. I don't know if the exact copy of George Carruthers' camera was used in, yeah, I, I'm saying this and remembering reading about another place where it was used and I can't directly recall. I know that there was also a replica that he built for use down here on earth, but it was really the predecessor of a lot of the modern UV telescopes that we have. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks. Hi, um, I, I was interested in your comments towards the end about the way that observing is now becoming much more automated and remote access and such like. Now, you know, since the pandemic and uh, uh, we've all got used to being able to, you know, attend lectures by lecturers at the other side of the world, people are being able to do their observing without leaving the, the, the comfort of their house. How do you feel this is going to change the field of professional astronomers? And do you think it's going to have an effect? For example, you know, one of the things that's notable somebody who is housebound can attend a lecture where they, mm -hmm. previously they might not have been able to. Do you think that's going to be, make a more, more accessible um, entry into the field of astronomy for professionals? I think I, I would love if that was one consequence of it. Um, I actually do write about this a bit in the book because even pre-pandemic, astronomy was seeing a shift to more and more remote and automated observing. There's a chapter in the book where I write about observing at a telescope in New Mexico from downtown Manhattan in New York City. And just the disconnect of being able to run a telescope from my laptop, sitting at my cousin's kitchen table, but the observations happening in New Mexico. Um, so even pre-pandemic, some telescopes operated remotely. Others took great pride in saying, nope, the astronomers have to come here. You have to sit on the mountain and have to probably isn't the best term because most of us loved doing it. But during the pandemic, these mountains had to shut down. Um, it sounds like the most socially distant job there is, but the, even the safety of the staff at the uh, mountains was threatened by the pandemic. So we had to completely close down operations for a long time. And then when we did start, things were done remotely. Lots of observatories picked up the ability to zoom with someone and run a telescope without people getting on airplanes or traveling to other countries. Some places are now doing a combination of live and remote. A lot have moved to remote. A lot of people miss the opportunity to go to the mountain and actually see the sky. Like these, it's some of the live observing experiences that I've had have been the best observing experiences of my career. But the accessibility is wonderful. And the accessibility of somebody who's housebound or even someone who just for professional or personal or family reasons can't disappear for a week at a time, the fact that they can still observe is really excellent. So the book already explores this a little bit and the big shift during the pandemic is bringing it front and center a lot more to everybody in the field. So we'll see how it goes. This is a comment on that. The title of the book is The Last Stargazers. And you talk about the almost 
what do you call it, the buzz of actually seeing something yourself, whether it's the rings of Saturn or the, you know, the damage done to Jupiter with the comet coming in, you're seeing these photons arriving at your eye and you wanted to do that yourself and couldn't do it in some of the big telescopes because they've all got for cameras and things on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Norman, you've got your hand up. Uh, yes, <clears throat> just following on from the, uh, the, uh, the automation thing is, uh, as it becomes more and more automated, people don't actually get the skills of pointing telescopes at, at objects, calibrating things, and so on. And there's this sort of disconnect between uh, effectively engineers who are running the, the observatories and uh, the, the astronomers themselves. Where I, I, and I, I, I'm just curious, is, is, is there a, a perceptible change in, in the way that jobs work like that? I mean, Hubble would have been twiddling with his plate on his telescope yeah. and, and, and tweaking the knobs and dials, but uh, you're not doing that anymore. Yeah, it's this is something that a lot of people brought up to me as part of talking about how the field is changing. Um, they talked about what this meant for current and future generations training to use telescopes. Um, and first of all, an interesting thing about Hubble is he was a good observer, but he had an observing assistant um, who was really spectacular at running the telescope. So for a long time, astronomers have only sort of run telescopes. I mentioned in that first story, the telescope operator who was in charge of taking care of Subaru and actually moving it because they're not gonna let us astronomers touch it. Um, nowadays, as things are more and more automated and people don't go, we've talked about how we train students to understand when the weather is good enough to observe. Just because the sky looks clear doesn't necessarily mean that you have perfect observing conditions. Um, students who are more used to just sort of running a telescope on a laptop like a video game might not be as familiar with what you need to build a good telescope. I have colleagues who build instruments and build telescopes themselves, and they're really interested in how a more remote shift is impacting the familiarity that their students have with how telescopes work. So I think it's, I think we can keep that knowledge and keep that familiarity with observing, but it's going to require an effort in the field to make sure that we don't get too completely disconnected from the technology we're using. Will, did you have another question? Yep, um, there's one question actually just flashed up on YouTube just after I'd um, asked, uh, said there was no questions. And it was from Russell uh, Nelson, who asked, and actually I was trying to think if you'd actually mentioned the answer already, but what did you actually do when that big clunk happened? Did you turn the scope off and on, or did you did you just leave it at, and take the advice that it was just a, a potential, um, you know, sort of un unforeseen error that was just one of those things? I, I think the answer I'm supposed to give is you'll have to read the book. Um, <laughs> but but um, Subaru is still standing and in excellent shape, so nothing too bad happens. <laughs> Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have a, a last question? Uh, big man? No. I was just wondering what your, Emily's view is on the input from uh, the likes of ourselves who are primarily Amateurs. Yeah, I um, when I was putting together this book, I had to give myself sort of limits on what it would cover. And I remember deciding I'm going to cover ground based astronomy. And there was a little bit of a stretch with the moon, but a book on things like Hubble or Chandra or Webb would be a whole separate tome. And I decided I had to stick to professional astronomy and not include stories of amateur astronomy, because, again, that could be its whole own book. Amateur astronomy is like, I, I think the term amateur really does a disservice to how much astronomers at all different levels do, whether it's doing 
outreach work with the community at an astronomy club level. Um, we have amateurs who have exquisite facilities that they built in their backyard or even built remotely in places like Chile that they operate. Um, people who are authors on scientific papers. There's, an, there's a massive association of amateur astronomers that study variable stars. So I think amateur contributions are fascinating. And a lot of times amateurs are now having these classic hands-on experiences that the professionals are automating more and more. So I would love to see a book. I have colleagues who work very closely with amateur organizations. I would love to see somebody write a book like this about the adventures and evolution of amateur astronomy because technology's really pushed that area very interestingly in recent years too. Thanks. I, I was just wondering because there are so many people who have mounts and optical tube assemblies that are actually classified as being near professional. So would that yeah. fit in with your view there? Yes. Yeah, no, there are some of the amateur facilities are astonishing. So I, like I said, I think we need a different term or a wider umbrella when we consider what non-paid professional astronomers contribute to the field because it's it's wonderful to see what people do. And I'm sure everybody who's on this Zoom call tonight and some of the ones on YouTube have war stories in their astronomy oh, yeah. careers as well. You know, so there's probably lots of great stories about mostly how things went wrong. There might even be some yep. about how things went well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. Anyway, thank you very much, Emily. That was an uh, excellent talk, excellent discussion. And uh, can we thank Emily, please? Thank you all so much for inviting me. This has been wonderful. You're welcome. And it was uh, excellent. Thank you. Just thank just you. a thing for a rainy Friday night in Edinburgh. Yep. <laughs> thank well, you for your wonderful think, enthusiasm. Uh, sorry? Thank I was you. just saying thank you for your wonderful enthusiasm. Emily. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. It's an easy topic to get excited about. Yeah. Read, buy the book or borrow the book no, no. because there's more. <laughs> <laughs> You're not paying him, are you? Am I? Any chance? <laughs> no, it's <this is> great. <laughs> Just for your reference, you had about um, seventy viewers on YouTube and uh, fifty odd on on the on on Zoom. So it was very good. And of course, we've got the um, recording, so it's lots of other people will be watching it in the future. So excellent, Emily. Excellent. Can can Thank we you. get some of your clear skies, please? <laughs> <laughs> I want some. <laughs> okay, well, with that, I think I'll call tonight's meeting to an end. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.